Before this happened to me, I had no idea anything like this could happen. I was awakened by a presence. Then I began to see these faces, and I wasn't quite sure what was going on. There was a long, like, needle. They said they were going to put this in, into my head, and it scared me to death. <laughs> they inserted something into me. <laughs> I blacked out. Stop it, please, stop it. I had a close encounter of the third kind, for <laughs> sake. Before the fall of 1985, I had no opinion about UFOs or alien abductions or anything like that. I probably would have scoffed, actually, if anyone said they'd been abducted by aliens. <laughs> At the time of my first encounter, we had a country house, very isolated. The property butted up against a large state-owned area of 15,000 acres of forest. And it wasn't actually even on any maps at that time. The private road hadn't been included in, in, in maps. We had nothing like satellite photos in those days. So we were just kind of off the grid. It's great, honey. I love it. Can I? <laughs> yes. We had enjoyed a lovely Christmas at our cabin. We'd had a wonderful time. Hey, uh, the weather report says it's going to snow tomorrow. Just as traditionally as you can. And it was just a lovely time. Sure. Every night, I walked, went from door to door and window to window, making sure everything was locked. Having lived in the city, I felt very isolated when I was out in that house. And I began to obsess about there being someone coming into the house at night when we were asleep. I would do that more than once, actually, in a night. I would wake up in the middle of the night and do it again. And I was filled with fear. I did not know really why. There was absolutely nothing suggesting anything unusual. But on some level, I knew damn well something was wrong. I was awakened by a whooshing sound. And I heard it. I sat up. Maybe it crossed my mind that it might be the dishwasher. I'd had an alarm system installed in the house, so I was confident that no one could get in. As I woke up, I became immediately aware of a presence.
before I could do or say a thing. I was gone, I was blacked out. After the blackout, something happened to my body. I didn't feel anything. I could feel my core being, my inner self, but there was nothing happening on the surface. I was like paralyzed or, and, and I had lost sensation. Then I remember a feeling like going up in a fast elevator. And uh, I saw the trees whipping past beside me. It happened so fast. I didn't get a chance to gather myself together. And I blacked out again. That's how it started. I found myself waking up. I couldn't move. And these figures began to dart around, and I wasn't quite sure what was going on. Then I began to see these faces, a big, long, narrow faces with big black eyes, but they were short. It opened the box, and there was a long, like, needle thing in the box. They said that they were going to put this in, into my head, and it scared me to death. It was devastating. After they inserted the needle into my head, uh, then the really unpleasant part physically began. They inserted something into me. I blacked out. I woke up in the morning confused. I felt like I'd been in a fight or something. I thought, this can't be true. This is absolutely ridiculous. But it was so vivid. By the time I went to the doctor, I had reconstructed the experience enough to tell him the sequence of events. And he laughed and he said, Whitley, you're telling me you were taken aboard a flying saucer by little men. I thought, my God, I am telling him that. What in the hell could that mean? And he examined me and he said, to be honest with you, Whitley, it looks as if you've been raped. In the weeks following this experience, I was very unstrung. I began to fear that something might happen to my family. I fought with my wife, and I tried to get her to go and live somewhere else with my son. They wouldn't be safe from them. Can I show the TV? No. We're still having supper right now. But we're not talking. Well, then concentrate on eating your food. I think I was probably quite short with him at times during that period. I was very concerned about them both. Maybe we should take a trip to the city. Just get out of here for a while. At first, when the memories began to return, I just couldn't believe them. I thought that I had been drugged by somebody or been hypnotized and had this experience implanted in my mind. I did not want to believe I had been abducted by aliens. I also had done some research by then and found out that there was a lot of UFO activity in the area. In fact, there was, uh, across the Hudson, there was a whole huge flap of the Hudson River Valley UFO sightings, which was still just in the process of ending when this happened to me. And that was only 30 miles away, 30, 40 miles away. My brother had given me for Christmas a book called Science and the UFOs. 
in it I found a description of something that was very similar to what happened to me and I was shocked but I still was just scoffing at the idea of alien abduction because at that point anything but what might have really happened was what I wanted to grasp on I wanted it to be something I could understand and handle but I couldn't stop thinking what if it's real stop it please stop it I had a close encounter the third time for sake. When I began exploring how to understand what had happened to me, the possibility of hypnosis became apparent. I've never been hypnotized before. I don't know if it'll work on me. Well, let me worry about that. Even under hypnosis, no one's gonna make you say anything that you don't want to, okay? You're the one who's in control, okay? Okay. All right, I want you to focus on my pencil. And while I do this, I want you to relax. Right, relax your face. Relax your neck and shoulders. And now I want you to relax your eyes. You can barely keep them open. When I went into hypnosis, what I saw was so vivid and so unexpected. Something went past the window. Something went past the window? Something big. Someone else is in the room. Who the hell is that? Is that somebody there? It can't be. I don't want to be there. I, I don't want to be there. Oh, God, stop it, please, stop it. Don't let me take me there. Stop! It's okay, Whitley. Look, you're safe. Okay? And that was why I was so paranoid and unstrung during the October-November period. But I had no conscious memory of it until it burst unexpectedly out in that hypnosis session. What I saw was so vivid and so unexpected to both of us that I basically think there's no way it wasn't a production of memory, not of imagination. Do you want to stop? No. I was obsessed with continuing because I wanted answers badly. I had a close encounter the third kind, for sake, I can't just ignore this. Now, it's the night of October 4th. You've just woken up. And tell me what you see. Under hypnosis, I saw one of these alien figures standing in my bedroom. It touched my head with a wand that had an electric fizzle to it. And it flashed terrifying visions. The first one I remember is a vision of my son. Something is happening to him. And I, I had the impression he was dying or being kidnapped or something uh, at the time, and it was very frightening. The second vision was a vision of my father dying. He died previously of a heart attack. He was already dead. And the sense of sadness I felt was profound. I loved him deeply. There was a third vision involved, an apocalyptic vision, the end of the world and of everything being destroyed, either in a nuclear war or a natural catastrophe of some kind that looked like a war. Uh, I remember the sense of despair and helplessness that it brought me. I've got to decide how I feel about this. I can't deny it anymore. When I began to gather myself together. I had met by this time other people who had had similar experiences. I began to ask myself, what did they want from me? I speculated about whether or not what seemed like a psychic attack could have been warnings. I have remembered more and more, not only the vision of the apocalypse, but other warnings and 
and consistent warnings, not only to me, but across the whole community of people who have had this experience, a lot of them get the same warnings, that we're in trouble, that our environment is in trouble. So I'm not alone in that. And I'm, that has become a really a central feature of my current life. I felt when I tried to move on that night was like I was being impeded by something that really slowed you down, like a thick tar or something. When they are there, you have a feeling that is almost impossible to describe. I was terrified, but I sort of forced a grin onto my face and tried to smile. I couldn't smile very well. I wanted to try to show them that I was not dangerous, that I was something that, that I wanted to know more. And there was a change then. After it became clear to them that I was trying to engage with them, they began to respond in various ways. They were trying to build a bridge, I think. I think that was the first moment when, when, when there was any kind of real exchange. I wouldn't say that, oh, this is definitely aliens. I would say that it was real and that we don't know what it was. That, that I am quite certain of. The public reaction to my book, Communion, was very complex. Literally, as soon as the book was published, letters that week, literally the week of publication, letters started coming. You got more letters. We had well over 200,000 letters over the years. We probably had closer to 500,000 over the years. I don't know what to say to them anymore. I don't have all the answers. Maybe just understanding the questions is enough. After I began to read them, I realized there's something happening on planet Earth that we do not acknowledge. We don't know what it is. Is it aliens? Is it something to do with us and something about the way we are that we don't yet understand? I don't know, but it's real. In the late summer, it became clear that we were running out of money. We began to not be able to pay our mortgage, and it became clear we had to leave. And so, at the same time, though, that this was happening, I was having the one of the peak experiences of the whole thing. I'd begun meditating in the cabin because people had found the place, and there were other people out in the woods at night looking for the aliens with, with flashing flashlights up in the air and such childish stuff. And. Uh, I, so I meditated, and I stayed in the house and meditated from then on. I didn't really want to be disturbed by that. And one night, there were these thuds on the roof right above me. And the next moment, I could feel a presence in the room. At this point, these years later, I was easy with their presence in the house. I wasn't scared of that. And I finally said, I want to see you as you really are. And I didn't see any. And so I said, well, this is it. I'm leaving this room now, and I'm leaving it forever. I will never return to it, because tomorrow we leave, and we're leaving forever. And I left the room. I went to bed. I lay in the bed, still hoping something would happen. Suddenly, I saw a light light up in the front yard. It was a bright, 
beautiful white light shining on the grass like moonlight, but it's 10 times brighter. I got up and looked out the window and this light with rays coming out of it and the rays penetrated my body, some of them, and I could like taste his presence in the rays. It was the most extraordinarily beautiful experience I've ever had. The next morning, we left the cabin, and the experiences have never been like that since. People who don't have open minds and are dismissive of all of this miss out on one of the most wonderful, frightening, dangerous, beautiful things that you can know. I did not ask for this. I did not know about it. I did not expect it. I did not want it, that's for sure. But it burst into my life without warning. And it's never left me since.